Yeah, yeah. So this is all around, as, as Chris was saying, all around sort of the mistakes that we've made over time. Let's see if I can turn this back on here. Perfect. Yeah, as Chris was saying, I'm an architect at Influx Cloud, and a lot of what we did originally was we put Prometheus metrics on all of our microservices. So our cloud product is all backed by Kubernetes. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about all the technologies. So, um, but it's all about knowing the audience, right? So, who here has used Kubernetes at all? Okay, well, we're going to move much quicker. Who here have used Prometheus? Okay, we're going to move very quickly. This is great. So, um, a lot of what we're going to, what am I going to talk about? You're all going to be like, well, that was not the best idea. And so, this is the, the curious case of a missing metrics. Um, we got this report from Nathaniel, who's the lead on the Flux team, that, that we're, we're, we were missing metrics for some reason. And the way he was doing it is his particular microservice, um, which is the Flux query engine in, in our Kubernetes, it was getting a different kind of set of results than some of the other microservices. And he was doing due diligence and making sure that the metrics that he was getting in were the metrics that he thought he should be getting, right? These are like meta metrics about yourself and your, and your own service. Um, I'm gonna give you what the answer is to this mystery, the caper now, but we didn't know this at the time and it took quite a while before understanding like what we had done was a little incorrect. The answer was is yours truly put in a, an additional label just one more label into our Prometheus metrics that had unbounded cardinality. And when you do that, the follow-on effects are, are not felt for much, much longer. So the suspects of this caper. Um, our stack is, is built on Kubernetes, and every one of our microservices exposes Prometheus metrics. And each one of these I'm gonna talk a little bit just briefly about. Um, our ingestion point is called Gateway. That has our API. It does some basic line protocol checking and so on and so forth. And it does our authorization and authentication. And Query D, which is the daemon that runs Flux. Okay, here are our suspects. Um, so our Prometheus endpoints, each one of our microservices, such as Gateway, there are Go processes that expose, that's the little Prometheus torch. They lead us to the light of metrics here at this endpoint. And, um, and for an example, these are some of the, the kinds of metrics that you show up. This is what's called the Prometheus exposition format. Uh, at this endpoint, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, uh, some people say a simplified SNMP, maybe it's more like a very opinionated SNMP where you could only like get an entire set of metrics in text on an endpoint. So for example, this has a little bit of description on uh, how Gateway is doing with garbage collection. It takes some time and so on. This is a, what's called a summary. You can split a summary up into different quantiles. Uh, there are gauges. So apparently at this point in time, Gateway was, had 252 Go routines running. Um, and you get some other interesting kind of byproducts such as like the version of Go and the amount of allocations, which we'll find out is a little scary. So um, there are more for these Prometheus metrics. So if you were to use Prometheus server to scrape, you would do something like this. You would say, Prometheus, I want you to scrape every so often and I'm gonna name, the, I have a name of a job. It's like the, the thing that's going to grab the data. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this in a second, specifically around what's called service discovery. So Prometheus as a, as a piece of software, it has this time series database, which means it can store the data, but it also goes out and gets it for you. And the majority of the work spent in, in the community around scaling Prometheus is around scaling the time series aspects, um, scaling the query aspects, but very little has been done around um, scaling the scraping aspects. Typically what people do is they say, well, okay, um, if, I'm, if I'm scraping too much data, then, well, you're either doing it wrong or you need to turn on more Promethei. 
So it's kind of a very active way of, of, of administrating your, cl your, cl your cluster of Prometheus. So Kubernetes. I just downloaded a bunch of these different like ways of describing Kubernetes. Like everybody, you know, you, you, you make a nice picture, you can write a blog about Kubernetes because it's fairly complex in terms of the kinds of things that you can accomplish with it. But the, the point I want to make about running something inside of Kubernetes is that at some level, there's isolation among a certain process. It's called a pod. And a pod could be one or more containers. But the important part about a pod is that you can put resource restrictions on it. Okay? You could say, hey, it's going to take this much memory. And you can restrict the amount of CPU. In the memory case, if you restrict a particular pod down, you're able to um, Say, if you go above that memory, Kubernetes will stop your process, kill it, and restart it. Now, if you were to do something silly like I did and add to another, you add another label to something, then your monitoring service, Prometheus, if it's also hosted in Kubernetes, it can grow and grow and grow in terms of memory. And at some point, much later after the offense has happened, much, much later, it can exhaust its memory and so on. So, your monitoring might be dying. So let's talk a little bit about Influx Cloud. Our ingress point comes in. These are our other suspects. Ingress points come in. Data flows into this gateway, and it go. And if there's a query, it runs to this query D. And every one of these has its own um, set of limits in Kubernetes. All right. Because they have their own sets of limits, if they are having a significant amount of uh, Prometheus data, that can have a significant impact of the amount of memory or even CPU that each one of these containers is using. Again, when you're trying to scrape something, one of the, excuse me, when you're trying to scale something in Kubernetes, one of the great things is, is you say, hey, I just want to add more replicas. Instead of replicas 30, it's like replicas 100, I'm sure that's fine. But downstream of this process, a downstream of the, of the ability to scale causes a, a huge, um, potentially a huge burden on your scrapers. Because instead of 30 items that have way too much data to scrape, now you may have 100 and so on and so forth. So the impact of where these kinds of scraping problems occur is felt in another place that the developer, who didn't know what they were doing, didn't get affected, or is not the one affected, but it's these, all these other systems that can be affected. Okay. So when using Prometheus, it's actually a pretty tricky to debug scraping problems. You kind of have to be like right on top of it. These are, this is uh, the Prometheus output about itself. So for example, if I were to have a scrape job called production 2.0, I can have some idea of what's actually happening here in Prometheus. But it's a little tricky when, when to know who's at fault for something. Because one of the aspects of scaling that's really important is it's not just the ability to say, I want 30 replicas, now I want 100. It's the ability to trivially understand problems in a system or isolate problems to a system so that you have predictable error conditions. When you're doing it in this way, when you have a single Prometheus or multiple Promethei doing something, you're only able to get very coarse kinds of scraping metrics. So what it all culminates in a single centralized scraper, well, memory can be exhausted if there's a single rogue metric producer. Um, so really, it's like who's watching the watcher? In Prometheus, sca scraping scaling is hard. What you end up doing is you could say, I'm going to have a little more granularity around my Prometheus uh, configuration. That granularity is really only allowed around namespaces and potentially services. And so what I'm demonstrating here is how to scale Prometheus is you would say, okay, for specific namespace A, this Prometheus, single Prometheus database is in charge for namespace B, misspelled here, that's supposed to be a B. That is a single Prometheus. But 
again, the, the problem here is you s may have isolated now something, your Prometheus problem down to a specific namespace. But again, the scaling issue is which one of my pods in the, name, in the specific namespace is causing this uh, tons of more metrics happening. So it becomes very, very difficult to debug. Um, so uh, additionally, if you follow this pattern out, like project this architecture out, you end up having a significant amount of uh, manual configuration, sort of like operator heroics. Now I'm, I have to find out that a new namespace has been created. Maybe our developers created something new, namespace C. Okay, now I'm going to have to make sure that there's a specific Prometheus that is scraping those targets, namespace D, and so on and so forth. So this is not something that is empowering you to the developers, it's significant operator overhead for scraping. Okay. Um, so, what did we do? So we, when, when we're having these problems around Prometheus and like how do, how do we identify the particular problems, what we wanna do is have more like extreme granularity of the scrape. Rather than a centralized sort of scraping service where you have to continually have many, many uh, um, Prometheus databases, each one of them is, is kind of like hand configured like its own little snow, no, snowflake, unique snowflake. What we said is, well, why don't we, this is supposed to be a symbol of a pod, why don't we, in a specific Kubernetes pod, put a telegraph, and that specific telegraph can act as a sidecar in the pod and can scrape the local process. Okay, uh, a pod, in case you don't know, is, is essentially a way of putting more than one process in a specific isolation. And Telegraph itself can do the scraping of that specific process, and if it gets overwhelmed, if it is doing too much scraping, if there's too many metrics, it's the only thing penalized. Rather than having a centralized server um, take too much data, you have a single sidecar that itself can be out of limits, or it could, be, it could blow out of its limits and then have potentially out of memory error here. So the impact, so the, when you think about scaling, you have to think about error impact. The error impact would happen specifically local to the developer's pod, rather than all pods for a set of an entire namespace. Okay, so this makes it so that, this extreme granularity of scraping makes it so that it's a really a developer problem. Uh, so we're just like, as an, if I think in terms of ops mine, we're throwing it back over the wall to the devs. Uh, but the nice thing about this is that we can have kind of unique scraping rules per person's application. Rather than having some sort of global configuration that has to be managed by uh, the heroic ops team that has every possible thing, you can actually put it locally to the, to the pod itself. Okay, so if uh, this isolation with the telegraph sidecar it's just quite, it's just this simple. So here's Gateway with a particular um, deployment. And as uh, in this specification, this Kubernetes specification, we have our 100 replicas of Gateway and we put our telegraph there. And telegraph is now going to scrape this local, the, the Prometheus metrics that Gateway itself exposes. Um, so could we debug this? There is a solution. Now what we can do is each telegraph that's sitting right next to the, the process, each process in the entire cluster can send, it can scrape locally, so it's penalized locally, but it can also have this, and this is really the key point. It can turn on internal metrics. It's just that simple, you input's internal. And the thing about what you can do with telegraph here, and I'm gonna show this in a moment, is that it can give metrics about itself because Again, when you think about architecture for systems that you want to have predictable error cases, what you want to do is be able to have a way of describing where the problem is at. If the problem ends up being that something around the scraping is too much memory or it's failing or gathering statistics, it's not gathering it correctly in some way, it will show up in this internal plugin. So it gives you that extra handle to, it's like metametrics, metrics about metrics. <clears throat> 
other thing I want to point out is it's really important to um, monitor the monitoring with maybe a different system. So this is, uh, you can get a free account at Influx, or Influx Cloud. And what I have here is what's called a name pass internal. What that's saying is for this specific data about Telegraph itself, so if, if it has its own capability to monitor itself, not just send it to a specific output, but also send just those very small number of metrics, just the internal metrics, to a second output. The idea is that you could have this other system, this, in, our, in our case, our SaaS product, for um, putting some metrics about the quality or the metrics that you can look at later. Because when, me when metrics do fail or when collections do fail, sometimes it's at the, at the metrics um, storage point. So potentially having this extra debug path is very, very useful. Okay, so what do we find out? So we instrumented it, uh, all of our things, all of our um, processes, our pods with this telegraph sidecar. And it became very clear what was happening so far. This is what's called an unbounded cardinality. The rest of these metrics are other services in our, in our stack. We needed to find out like who was the, who did it? You can't do that exactly with Prometheus itself but you can with Telegraph, because it can tell, say which part, which pod was it actually using. So this is our input Prometheus. We're saying from the environment, our production US West. And we want to know its role. So in blue, the role was gateway. And in orange, the role was query. Query has fairly uh, linear, this is a deploy, fairly linear number of, of metrics over time, whereas gateway has this growth that's happening. So now we kind of have some idea of what's, what's actually occurring. It, something about Gateway is adding more and more data. So we've got our smoking gun. So looking a little bit closer, you look at the metrics themselves, you go to the slash metrics endpoint on Gateway. What did we do? Well, here's, this right here is a particular metric, HTTP API request durations. And it is a histogram. And we have a series of labels, which is like descriptions of these metrics. Um, and all you have to do is do one label too far. And we have, th this, the cardinality for this handler is fairly fixed. The cardinality for the methods, there are only a certain number of HTTP verbs. The path itself is actually unbounded. The status codes are bounded. There's only a few, uh, what, 100 through 500. It's like this user agent, whoops. So this is completely unbounded. In fact, it's fairly free form. So when you look at it, you're like, oh, <laughs> of course. Um, well, there was this issue. We should extend our telemetry to capture the user agent because what we want to do is, is characterize the data more. And now that you can see it, you're like, well, that, you shouldn't have done that. But that's not the answer we should go for. That's a very after the fact sort of answer. Sometimes you actually do want to describe your data in, in a in more precise and give it more context than, than you may be allowed. But labels mean more cardinality. But in the intent of labels in Prometheus is to identify uniquely a particular metric. User agent is not identity in this case. User agent is additional context. So here is the offending piece of code. Uh, right, so I'm saying, okay, we, we want these handlers, here's these labels, and look, you can see it right at the end. We'll solve this issue, we're just gonna tack this on, I'm sure it's fine. But the follow-on effects of doing this was felt way, way after this kind of, um, the code was added. So when you debug something, at the time that you debug it, if you don't have a very clear idea of how to actually look and check your metrics at those times, then you, potentially have a, a problem that you have to take a significant amount of time to debug. But what if you flip that script and then make it more of a developer problem? So the problem here is that, in theory, what Prometheus allows you to do server-side is you could scrape and you could say, hey, I just want to drop that agent metric. Yeah, okay, so the developer, whoops, they did this problem. So it's a very coarse solution where you could say, well, I'm gonna allow scraping to happen anyway, Prometheus, but I'm going to take that particular label and I'm just gonna drop it. Um, 
And from a developer, from a defensive perspective, yes, this works, but it's very custom and it's very operation focused in a central location. And you know, it's not particularly ideal because there is context that you're losing. But if we have a telegraph sitting right next to and scraping um, pr our Prometheus metrics locally, this gives us a chance to write a lot more custom uh, logic for our specific use case. Um, this is a way of solving the problem, but I would not call this a scalable solution. It is a way of saying, look, we're going to give the developer power to add processing. So this local telegraph can take the um, a specific tag, user agent in this case, and convert it to a field. So the nice thing about if you use Influx as the backing store for, for these metrics, you can have, you can contain more labels, you can add more um, context to your metrics, but you don't pay the cardinality uh, tax, or you have the ability to convert. And this allows um, you to have a very, the same kind of debuggable Prometheus output, but gives more of that context on the server side. So you're trying to retain the context. Okay. But are there any ways that we can like put guardrails around these problems? See, the, the problem here is it's not just one thing to have this custom configuration right near the, for the developers to do, give them our developers patterns on how to do something. But is it possible to make it that these kinds of things were preventable in the future? Again, in Prometheus, you really have the centralized server where you can do label dropping, but Telegraph, if we put that agent as that layer of indirection in between, has one other thing that you can do, as of recently, called tag limiting. Imagine that you're like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm the developer and I make my metrics, and you know, I'm going to put some guardrails around how much of these tags are available to come out. The nice thing about doing it in this way is you can preferentially preserve certain tags, like handler, method, and status but you might have a hard cap of four. So you're preserving, so upstream will have like less impact on its cardinality. You're giving the opportunity for the developers to add in their feature, check to see if it's something that they find is, is particularly useful, give them context, but it puts a little bit of guardrails on so that they are not, oh, they don't overwhelm downstream processing. This is useful because uh, once you do feel like maybe you don't have an unbounded user agent, such as me, then uh, you can say, okay, oh, I like my metrics, I'm gonna update this. As a developer, your operations team doesn't have to do all this hand-holding, because it's local to the pod itself. It's a completely runtime solution. So this is not like a need to do compile time. So with Prometheus metrics, the only way I could have like prevented this is to basically go into the code, remove that label, and start again, recompile, redeploy. That's a much more expensive cycle than simply changing the configuration. Okay, so um, passwords. Again, it's the same, same playbook. Um, it's very hard to rotate Prometheus passwords because it's all centralized. So if you've got a password protected like metrics, this is something that is not necessarily done uh, all the time, but it's, it's particularly useful if you're like us and we, we want to like, make sure that those metrics are private in some way. In, in a Kubernetes world, the kinds of exploits that could happen could potentially see these kinds of metrics internally, so what do you do? If you were to use Prometheus as a server, as, a, as the scraper, you end up needing to have what's called a bearer token, so like if, you know, this one is Hunter 2, so if this um, globally would have to be kept, if I wanted to rotate those passwords or this particular uh, bear token, I would have to restart my centralized collection, my centralized scrapers, and then also restart the entire services. So there's a, there's a disjoint there uh, because there'll be a point in time where something cannot be collected. Only the one of these two things will be out of sync. Okay, so what can we do? Instead, we do the same thing again. Oopsie. Same, same playbook. With this input Prometheus, 
local to the container, we can put the bearer token. We put the power back to the developers again. So the developers can now rotate their own credentials for themselves, it's local to the particular pod. There's no need to have a centralized service be, stop collecting its metrics. This thing can, because it's local to the pod itself, can scrape the metrics and it's contained in this authorization locally, okay? So what do people typically do? You just, they don't use passwords or they have a centralized password store where there will be known error conditions. In this case, when Prometheus, or excuse me, when Kubernetes restarts a pod, it will also be able to um, restart this telegraph at the same time, they're conjoined. So from an architectural perspective, that allows a kind of a scaling solution around passwords and password rotation. Okay, so a couple of lessons here. Um, it's important to think that scaling is not just like I should have more of the thing. Like if I, if I want a fly swatter, getting a bigger and bigger fly swatter is not necessarily the solution to making it a better system. And I think we, when, as architects and, and developers and operators, we need to stop saying things like you're doing it wrong. I think that's an opportunity to figure out a completely different pattern that might work to scale systems in a different way. Like you're doing it wrong is very like after the fact. So if we, if we can empower developers to do things themselves, like putting the collection near their device so that they can actually configure it themselves, it gives a substantial amount of, of more um, granularity and tuning to the problem at hand. And finally, and, and I said this multiple times and I wanna really underscore this, scaling is really thinking about and predicting your failure modes. It's not just can we um, just add more Prometheus to, the, to this particular problem? It's, it's thinking about how do I avoid completely a set of problems? All right. We're gonna do a quick caper. The time when we were missing solid alerting. So, um, it always comes down to this. You, you have this kind of unease, like am I getting all the metrics I'm supposed to be getting? It's not always clear, and it's not clear at all with Prometheus if you can do that. But I wanna keep my Prometheus metrics hosted on, on my, on my um, pods. In fact, it's even hard to know if Prometheus is alive itself. Like is it scraping, Did it, is it healthy, is it doing the thing that it's supposed to be doing? So what we came up with um, was something called Cube Inventory. And uh, what Cube Inventory does is it kinda, it's another Telegraph plugin. And what Cube Inventory does is it says, here, these are the number of pods and things that you're supposed to have available in a particular deployment. Um, and again, you can output that information to InfluxDB or, and send any problems collecting that information to some sort of external, external system. Now the interesting thing about this is, and this is the, the end of this caper, this was back in, when we were using Telegraph 1.9. Um, if that's legible at all. Basically it's the number of container, or number of pods that are supposed to be there, 96, they're supposed to be 96, but how many were actually gathered? 30. And so now we, if we oh, we've got the unease, now we know. Now we can alert about it. We were missing metrics. We were not alerting on certain things because the scrapes didn't happen. So you need to push those, those kind of metrics closer and closer to what your action, the questions that you wish to answer. Are we doing a good job understanding the metrics around us? So let's briefly talk about some of these designs. Essentially the design I keep talking about over and over again is this, where we have a particular uh, Go application, sending metrics to, scraping the, the Prometheus and sending it to InfluxDB. Or if you, if that particular InfluxDB is not spending, it's not really able to ingest nearly as many metrics. Like we, we're on the order of 50 million, I think, metrics every 10 seconds. So we put way too many metrics in. You can put this in enterprise and put a load balancer in front of it, which allows, allows the um, Influx Enterprise to break apart a bunch of this and 
get the ingestion becomes much less of a problem. Additionally, there are other things, and, and David, you spoke about this briefly, uh, where you can take your telegraph, same basic pattern, and you can send it into Kafka, and then pull off another telegraph and put it into Influx Enterprise. So there are many of these kinds of uh, architectures that can be used to continue to scale these things. What properties do we like about these two? Ultimately, the that between this is an API, these units don't really have to know what's happening on this side. These influx on this side, or the, the data store, does not really have to understand much about it on this side. It's decoupling the problem, like it's classic architecture. But in when you use a Prometheus to do the scraping and your data storage, you have to couple together the, the notion of what they have to what has to be scraped and how to store it and how to deploy it and operate it. So we need, ultimately, I think there needs to be some notion of, of an API that allows transparency between the two, two the multiple pieces. Okay, to kind of sum up some of these kinds of things, um, really, you, you have to measure and test that your metrics are scaling. Like, are you missing metrics? I, I hope you feel like this is like the fear, uncertainty, and doubt aspect. Maybe that's just how I feel about when I'm monitoring my services. But it really is this. Um, I think decentralized, and we, John, Luke, and I've gone back and forth on this a lot. I think decentralizing metrics, metric gathering, is actually pretty important because um, metrics and and how a metric or a particular program is being monitored is very near and dear to that particular program's heart. And at that point is where the best knowledge or the smarts can be about how something should be scraped or collected. If you centralize metrics gathering, what ends up happening is you spend a lot of time with kind of heroic needs of, of configuration. And there's only certain amounts of configuration that can be done in a central way that is general purpose enough. Sometimes specific solutions are more important than, than generalized configuration. And ultimately, you really want to empower your developers. If you, if you allow your developers to control their local tooling, then they can do various kinds of aspects like perhaps moving a label to, to a field and this sort of thing to give them that extra context because they're gonna know what kinds of metrics loads they want. Additionally, if you, if you use Telegraph as, as an agent, then you have a bunch of other kinds of opportunity to send metrics in different ways. If in fact, perhaps the exposition format is not uh, descriptive enough. I don't really want to say this carefully, but I feel like the first order conclusion is it's it's really easy to shoot yourself in the foot with with Prometheus metrics. I, I think there needs to be care in thinking about it ahead of time in, ter in terms of schema and in terms of how it's collected and so on and so forth. Um, but that's it's powerful, but it's easy to, to make it hurt. Um, I feel like the less that we have to have, the more we want to empower our users and the less we need operations to handle scaling and things like that, the more responsible people are, more understanding of their own program they can be. Um, I, this problem about, I do actually want user agent. Yes, it was not a great idea that I did that, but I do want that information. Sometimes it's tricky to express that in Prometheus. Specifically, because my one mistake can impact everyone outside of, uh, outside of my, my specific microservice. Maybe more aggressively, second order conclusions. I, I feel like this Prometheus is not necessarily descriptive enough yet. It, it ends up being fairly, fairly tricky to change over time, too. Um, I think that the metrics game is not really solved yet. I feel like with open telemetry, for example, it can do Prometheus, but it also has the ability to be slightly more descriptive, but it separates out the notion of the collection of and the reporting of the metrics into two different pieces, which is more natural to, to how developers want to work in a more API-oriented way. And um, I just want to sneak in s and um, Probably not one answer to everything is what, what we need to do with Prometheus. So, it is very good to use, get yourself off the ground, 
but you, you run right into scaling problems very quickly. So I think um, giving developers the ability to um, scale their metrics needs in a, in a better and better way through something like a telegraph lends a lot more power and, spec and specificity to the metrics themselves. Okay, I just briefly wanna say, like, we, we've, we drink our own champagne in a sense, so, but one of the things that we're going to uh, attempt to do in the future, um, Paul talked about this yesterday, is we're gonna put Flux into Telegraph as a processor for transformation. Ultimately, the idea is, is if you can push your code closer and closer to your data, or in our case, you put Flux nearer and nearer the uh, Prometheus metrics that allows you to, to do more sophisticated kinds of um, um, transformations early in the system. So that potentially could even allow Telegraph to, uh, to send out an alert immediately. So rather than going through an entire scrape cycle and so on and so forth, until you get an alert very late in the game, you can do it very quickly, which is kind of interesting. Um, finally, you know, we're thinking about having Flux scripts possibly even hosted in the Influx API, which allows Telegraph to, to download um, like Flux programs and maybe this would be like sampling rules from the server, like a centralized configuration point that can push uh, configuration to clients. But what we wanna know is what else? And that's the, I wanna ask the audience here is, what other kinds of things could we do in order to help these kinds of scaling problems and so on? All right, well thank you very much. Hi, thanks for the presentation, really good. Um, so I had a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, like, why do you need a load balancer with Influx Enterprise when what are you load balancing between there? So Influx Enterprise can have more than one data or ingestion node. So it's essentially a, the storage and its write path has many, many nodes. Mm -hmm. And the load balancer is effectively a round robining over those. And uh, either Telegraph can actually have built-in rules to do so for example, Telegraph can say, I want to write to you know, many different influxes and it would load balance it itself. Or if you want Telegraph to be slightly less smart, you put a load balancer in front of it and Telegraph can write to one point and it can get multi or, um, distributed around. Does Telegraph uh, know if one of those ingesters goes down? So, it's so, that's, so Telegraph itself, if you were to list each data node directly, would not but the load balancer has a health check and would take that one out of the pool until it came back up. So it's just kind of a nicer abstraction. Okay, yeah. thank you. And the second question is, um, you talked about cardinality reduction by capping the number of tags, uh, which doesn't actually limit the, the possibility space of the cardinality because you can still have 10,000 values in one tag and 10,000 in another, and you can still overcome you know, the, the capabilities. Um, is there a way to reduce the cardinality for an individual tag? So even if you're getting 100 values, you only get 10? Yeah. Yes, so there's, there's kind of like two things there. I'll go with the to limit it. You, so Telegraph has the ability to rewrite um, a specific tag. So given a regular expression, you can say, hey, I want to tr transform that regular expression into something else. Like maybe in the case of a, a particular path, like an API path, API v2 ID number that's that's non-unique, you could just say, hey, that, that particular path is query or is organization or something like this to rewrite it to decrease the tag space significantly. Telegraph can do a top in, yes. Yeah, it, it's called a, it's a pro top end processor, maybe it's called top K, top K processor. Um, you want to maybe you want to talk to Daniel a little bit about that one. I'm I have not used it. What, yeah. What um, what is your use case for that? Oh yeah, sure. Perfect. Oh yeah, repeat it. So sorry. the The question was: Is there an ability to use top n as a cardinality reduction? But isn't it expensive? Okay, so this is a, this, I was really hoping that somebody would ask this question. <laughs> do we, where do we wanna put expense? So no matter what, at, at some level, you have, to, you have to 
pay for something at some time. Ultimately, what you want to do is push the expense closest to the offending program as possible. Yes, no, it depends. Yes, no, it depends, exactly. And I feel like these are just the opinions that, that we went through, but my point is for us to think about it more in architectural space where we can put those kinds of decision points in many places and not just necessarily in one centralized location. In case of, say, sidecar, for example, you will be facing the same problem which you just described. And I hope to. I hope to have the sidecar problem be where the, the issue is because then there's less of these kinds of pollution of all metrics and all services as compared to the one in the middle. And certainly, you go ahead. Yeah, my question was actually absolutely different. Uh, in regard to the, your example of the Kubernetes inventory, I hope you are talking about not the sidecar configuration, but it's a, a, a telegraph which will be running on the, as a daemon set, for example, on the... Yeah, it's a daemon set that's near, near the API itself. Yeah. So uh, I am, I'm asking this question because I don't really know in such busy very well. Uh, in an example, you convert a user agent to a field. So uh, what happens, is it becoming a site? For example, if I have a user agent, uh, Ruby, JSON, something like that. Safari, right? something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I search right, with a particular user, user agent name, do I see the kind of one of the user yes, agents, so, right, the so right. So your question is, if I, if you don't, if something become, goes from a tag to a field, is yes. it searchable? Yeah, yeah. So it is searchable. It's just at substantially less speed. Okay, so it's mm -hmm. essentially not indexed. Okay, okay. But what can happen is that if you narrow the space of the things that you wish to look for significantly using the tags, mm -hmm. then the amount of data that you would have to search through is, is much much less. So if you knew that you were only concerned with, say, status code 500, mm -hmm. or 500s, and a specific route, such as maybe just queries, you're looking for those kinds of errors, then you could see if there's a pattern amongst the user agents that are running into that. Okay, so if I want to see a particular user agent. You can filter yeah, by a specific one, yes. All right, cool. Um, what we can do is, um, I'm sure there are more questions. Uh, Chris is available all afternoon, so we can either chat in the hall or we can go into the uh, technology room and get uh, more detail about that. So thank you, Chris.